it's clear that Jim and Matthew are going to make you uh, do some thinking in the next session. So over to you, Jim. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And uh, what an honor to be here. I want to thank the organizers. This is one of my uh, very favorite gatherings. And, you know, I'm sure it's been said repeatedly, but, you know, what a, what a shame that we can't be together in person. I look forward to next year uh, as, a, as a better year for, for visiting and, and, and the like. But, uh, you know, thank you so much. Uh, what, a, what an honor to, to be here with you today. So many great topics. Uh, I'm a little biased, but I think this one is really going to take the stage in, in many respects, and I'm excited about it. Um, I want to uh, just get into a little bit. I'm, I'm really proud to be uh, joined here by futurist uh, Matthew Griffin. Matthew is a world-class futurist. He's CEO of the 311 Institute. Uh, he's described as the advisor behind the advisors, uh, which I think is a uh, is a, is a great, uh, great way to describe Matthew. I've gotten to know him a little bit over recent weeks, and I think we're all in for a treat on, on this discussion. Matthew's clients uh, include the G7, G20 governments, Accenture, Aon, uh, BCG, Deloitte, uh, Lego. My kids would be uh, uh, happy to see that. Uh, Microsoft, Samsung, it's, it's really the list goes on. Uh, anybody that's really interested in where uh, trends are going and how to explain them, how to frame them, the impacts on revolutionary emerging technologies on a global culture and in our industry. Uh, Matthew, what a, what a treat it is to have you with us here today. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say before we jump right in, but please feel free. Well, it's great to be here and it would be even better if we could be doing it in person. But yeah, bearing in mind, you know, the, the sort of current circumstances, I think we're doing really well to, uh, to just be here at all. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's a it's a fascinating thing. Talks a, speaks speaks incredibly about our uh, our logistics and innovation that we've been able to move vaccines the way that we have. And uh, I know it may be slower than many think, but if you think about uh, how quickly it's had, it's it's an impressive feat. And yeah. there's a lot of people that deserve accolades uh, accolades for that. Um, Matthew, today I want to take our time together, and I want to I want to break it into three buckets, and and two we'll make pretty quick work of, I think, and, and get to the meat of it. Uh, but the first is really a, a look back in in history. Uh, the second is still a look back, but but very recent, the last maybe 10, 15 years, and then we'll get into uh, what you do best, and we'll we'll talk about the future. Uh, so if you're comfortable with that, we'll frame our discussion in, in those three sections. That's right. Um, Perfect. Well, let me let me just put forward kind of a, a, a thought that I've had for a number of years, and I'll, I'll put it to you and see whether you agree. Uh, in many respects, I think the history of infrastructure from, say, 1920, 1930, all the way up to about 2010 was relatively static. Uh, cars did what cars did and trains did what trains did. People interfaced with them in, in relatively uh, static ways. Heck, many of our, our transit systems have the same bus routes that they did uh, uh, 50 years ago. And, and the interface between the utilities also relatively the same, both generation and, and consumption. You, you turn on the switch and the light comes on and you, you have your dinner and you go to bed. Uh, yeah. What do you think about that? Is that, a, is that an overly critical statement to say that we really were in a static period for all of those years? No, I think it's actually right. Although, I, I personally, I'd actually kind of, I'd, I'd be arrogant enough to try to sort of correct you on one point. But um, I'd actually even push that date back, 1920s, and actually kind of go back 18, you know, 1880s, 1850s even. You know, if you have a look at the combustion engine, the combustion engine itself actually hasn't changed or hadn't changed really for a hundred years. Sure. And uh, ironically, the, fir the first electric vehicle, I've even got a photo of the first electric vehicle, uh, actually started emerging in 1912. There's this elderly lady sort of plugging in this car like we do Teslas today. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Static is, is probably an, an understatement for many of these industries. But it's not to, it's not to take away for how transformational those things were on society and industry, uh, the mobility and the freedom that it gave. Uh, I mean, for instance, you know, here in America, the electrification of rural society boosted productivity in tremendous ways. I mean, those were those were amazing things, but there weren't tremendous advances in them for for so many years, both in the technology itself and in the. Uh, and in the uh, in the consumption of them, the the, the what I kind of call the citizen centric nature of them. Uh, so I'm glad to glad to see that I wasn't completely off base on that. Uh, let's move forward. I, I'm going to share kind of a personal anecdote. Uh, so the, many people watching know that I've had a 
the privilege of serving in government a, a couple of different times. Uh, let's go back to 2004, 2005 timeframe when I entered into USDOT. Uh, remember, we, we, you know, that may seem like a long time ago, but we weren't, uh, we weren't tethered to a desk phone. We actually had things called Blackberries and they were a tremendous step forward over, uh, over what we had had before. But it didn't enable the interface into different systems the way that the iPhone revolution brought, uh, brought on. And so I would say that going back to that static nature, we were still in that static nature through the iPhone, I mean, through the, the BlackBerry era. And it wasn't really until I was leaving government that you started to see the signs of transformation, the signs of really uh, harnessing that iPhone revolution, if you will, into, into a, an ecosystem. And I, I shared this with you the other day, Matthew, but my, my daughter came up to me once and she asked, you know, Daddy, I'd, I'd like to see a picture of this certain event in your life, you know, going back and, you know, can you pull it up? And I kind of scratched my head and I said, you know, Angel, I'd love to show that to you, but, but I don't have that. That's in, a, that's in a photo album someplace. And she looked at me and I think this is demonstrative of how society has evolved she couldn't grasp a time and space when you didn't have access to that information immediately, all information. Yeah. It was foreign to her as a, as a concept. And, and I think society has moved. So we don't remember hardly a time before Uber, before scooters, before e-bikes, before real-time information on our transit systems, before being able to buy an e-ticket for the train. You know, all of these interfaces have really transformed and it's a two-way street of data uh, both us consuming data, making decisions, making purchases, enhancing our lives, but also giving data back and enhancing that service in a different way. And, and I, I would think that that has really, really been a disruptive and, and consumer enhancing, societally enhancing thing. But please, Matthew, talk about, talk about that era. And then we're going to get into a few examples of what we're seeing here. Oh, well, absolutely. So, you know, when you have a look at the, we'll call it the iPhone era. You know, we started unlocking the app economy, the data economy, you know, big data was at the top of the Gartner hype cycle basically for a little while and it got replaced by cloud and all these other things. Yeah, then we started seeing uh, the, the proliferation of APIs basically coming through, basically in the digitization of different sectors and industries and things and everything else. And uh, I mean, yeah, even even when you have a look at the, the the accelerating rate of change, basically on culture, you know, my kids uh, they're only sort of six and eight. You know, even now, basically, they sort of grew grew up basically in an age where cars make noises. You know, when they were younger, they'd be getting a car and they're going, you know, as they do. You know, my daughter <laughs> was still doing it this morning. But you know, when we start having a look at some of the newer generations that start coming through in the next few years, you know, electric cars are completely silent. You know, so all of a sudden, you know, children in, say, five years time, you know, when they get a car out, they're just going to be going, <laughs> you know, uh, not making a noise. So absolutely, you know, when you have a look at the power of the, the sort of increasingly hyper-connected digital, connect, you know, digital society, um, it's, it's transforming, ab data is transforming every single part, basically, of society today. And it's kind of putting all of these different disruptive things that we're seeing today on steroids, because we now have data that we can analyze, that we can act on, basically that we can inspect. You start overlaying artificial intelligence on top of that data. I think I mentioned, was it Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh just put uh, artificial intelligence into their traffic light system. You know, nothing necessarily sort of more than that. And yet they've managed to shave over 400,000 hours of traffic time, basically just by putting AI into a basic traffic light system. You know, imagine mm -hmm. what you can now do when you start overlaying artificial intelligence on top of the data sets in smart cities, whether it's at a sort of regional level, a national level, or even a continental level. You know, the, the future looks amazing and staggering at the same time. You know, Matthew, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. So, so one quick thing, when I was at USDOT most recently, we were talking about regulations to make those electric cars make a sound yeah. uh, just from a pedestrian safety standpoint and, and regulating uh, noise so that uh, people would know that they were there. So it's, your kids might be able to make a noise, but we don't know what it'll sound like. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's funny that you, you get to this. I, I agree with you on, on, on so many of the things that you just said, but I want to I raise kind of two examples of things that I think are, are really uh, meaningful. And what it really comes from is, I think, the aggregation of data in many respects and the use of data. Um, and so I've, I've really took a fascination with a lot of uh, kind of startup nation, you know, Israeli tech, and there's a lot of really interesting ideas coming out of Israel right now. But 
that's not to, to denigrate what's coming out of Silicon Valley and, and, and China and so many other places. Uh, and we could talk about uh, aggregated and disaggregated data and the way that's, uh, the way that's uh, structured and unstructured and, and like. But what's really interesting, there's this one company uh, that is, is the name is Waycare and they're aggregating data from vehicles uh, and, and so many of the different ways that you can do that. They're taking it from cell phone data and the accelerometers and the cell phone. Uh, and just one quick example is they can analyze the real-time data coming in. Uh, and if you are in front of me on the freeway and you do a hard break and a swerve and I come behind you and I do a hard break and a swerve, then the AI basically determines that there's an obstacle in the roadway maybe a box fell out of a truck, maybe something happened, they can deploy and are deploying remediation to that before the accident even occurs. Uh, and so this is really intelligent stuff that's happening out there. And it, it might not be uh, transformative in the way that maybe, uh, you know, one might think of, of, uh, of changing millions of people's lives all at once. But if you can prevent that accident, if you can prevent that injury, that property damage, perhaps that death, uh, they are incredibly important. And then as a, as a real transportation nut, all of the congestion that backs up from, from those accidents, we're talking about millions of gallons of gasoline in aggregate and all of the wasted time and productivity and uh, time with families and, and the like. So, you know, really interesting. But, you know, I want to take a minute and talk about, and all of that is, is built on the back of data, but I want to talk about another use of data, which I think a lot of people take for granted, and that is ride share. Uh, if you think about how incredibly complex uh, what Uber has done, uh, what others have followed behind them are doing, it's really transformative, right? So let's just take a, a, a ride share, like say an Uber pool, uh, uh, and, and it has to know where you are, where you're going, where I am, where I'm going, what the traffic conditions are so that it can adjust pricing, uh, the supply and the demand, all of these things coming together it's an incredibly complex ecosystem to get right. And it's just absolutely tremendous. And all of that is, is this flow of data that allows that to happen and allows that point to point on demand service kind of choice uh, uh, mobility in certain ways that, that really just didn't exist before. I, I remember leaving USDOT in you know, 2008 at nine or 10 o'clock at night. And I didn't know if there was gonna be a taxi out there. And if I walked across the street to the transit system, I might've missed it. The next train might be 30 minutes away, yeah. right? And all of that is an enhancing decision-making and qualities of life and the like. And so we're gonna put a question to the audience here in just a second, but reactions on those two examples that I just raised, Matthew? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Well, so when you have a look at Uber, for example, you know, the, when we think that we already have access to a huge volume of data, it's going to pale into insignificance what we have today compared to what we have tomorrow. So, for example, you know, when we have a look at the customer experience, particularly as it relates to, say, transportation, yeah, you know, customers want everything now. So real time basically is the new minimum. Uh, in addition to that, basically, they want everything to be not just hyper personalized, but we can increasingly hyper hyper personalized basically all these different experiences. But they also want all of these experiences to come to them without having to expend any effort. So, for right. example, you know, when we start having a look at, you know, some of the future, you know, future things that we can do with data, we can do it now, but, you know, we can, you yeah, know, the systems are still coming through. You know, for example, you know, the, the smartphone already knows when you leave the office. You know, if you start embedding enough intelligence into Uber's algorithms and everything else, they can figure that if you come out of your office and it's five o'clock and you turn right, then you're probably going home. So they should already have a cab waiting for you that you don't even need to call it up. You know, and the taxi driver basically says, you know, hey, Bob, I'm over here. Uh, let's go. You know, let's go. So when we start talking about, you know, the customer experience and the frictionless customer experience, basically from a transportation perspective, yeah, there are a huge number of new data sources that we can actually pull things from. We can pull information from local CCTV. We can pull information from overhead drones, for example, in Chicago. Uh, we've got pers persistent surveillance drones that can literally track you from above. So they can, it's like TiVo for towns. Um, yeah, we, this is all just the tip of the iceberg. You know, increasingly, we've we've sort of moved from this era when transportation basically was relatively inefficient. You know, when you have a look at the startup communities, they're always looking to try to solve inefficiencies. 
We've got artificial intelligence moving to the edge. You know, Teslas are supercomputers on wheels, basically with GPUs. We're going to have artificial intelligence actually built into the chips with things like ARM, you know, sort of uh, chipsets and technologies, uh, which make reaction times even faster. When you have a look at connecting all these different vehicles together, you, as well as other devices, when you connect a device to the cloud and you embed artificial intelligence in the cloud, you can have cars on one side of the planet see something not know what it is, then they learn what it is, and they can transmit that data in a sort of a hive-like mind construct to the other vehicles on the other side of the planet. So if a car in Japan sees something that it's never seen before, like a shadow, once it knows what that shadow is, it can teach the rest of the fleet what that thing is instantly. So sure. we are only, as I say, you know, we're only sort of skimming the surface basically of what we're going to be able to do really even within the next couple of years let alone the next decade you know i want to i want to comment on that but before we do that if we can i'm going to ask the organizers here to help us by putting a question up uh and to the audience because we're going to we're going to touch on uber here for just a second um so paul i think it is or kirsty can we put that question to the audience here now So I can't see it, but I'm going to trust that one is coming your way. And when I do, we're going to we're going to uh, read it, but we're going to come back and get the answers. But it's about Uber and what the audience thinks is going to happen to Uber. Um, it looks like it is maybe coming up now. Yeah. Let's see. And I'm not seeing that. I tell you what, while you do, while that's coming in, Matthew, I'm going to just say one example when I was at DOT that I was really interested in is think about a, a, a road operator. Uh, they only anecdotally know where the hydroplaning spots are on that roadway, right? I mean, we all have had that experience before. And when you do it, you're really white knuckled and you're just, you know, fearing for your life. You've come through uh, an experience that made your heart stop for a second. But the last thing you, you would do is actually take note of precisely where that was so that you could call someone and tell them to go fix it. Yeah. But that car with traction control and geolocation knows where that is. And if we can create the data sharing environment, think of all the things that we can do. It's just one little, I love how you framed it as the tip of the iceberg. There's so many data use cases out there. Uh, I really believe that this is going to be going to be transformative. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to ask for your help. I, I can't see the question. Can you? No, I can't see the question, but I do know what it is. Uh, it looks like we have some things coming in, but um, I'm not able to see it. It might be my eyes. It looks really tiny. <laughs> it looks really tiny. Uh, so the question basically is, uh, gosh, this is absolutely tiny. I'm glad that everybody else can see this better, uh, but it's basically asking the, the audience whether or not Uber in five years is going to make a lot of money, a little money, um, uh, go broke or, or uh, I'm sorry, break even or go bust. And uh, what we have here actually is, uh, is a, a, a good percentage of people think that they're going to make a lot of money. Uh, and I know that that's going to be really interesting for us in, as we move into the next section, which we'll do so here in, in just a minute. But, you know, I think, Matthew, if I can, I think that the period that we're in now has been disruptive in so many ways, right? We've seen that ride shares have stolen uh, rides from from transit systems. It's enhanced mobility in certain ways. We know that scooters and e-bikes and other things have created first mile, last mile uh, connectivities. We know that we're getting smarter about our water usage, uh, smarter about our electricity usage. The data that these utilities are able to provide us about our own habits uh, are making smarter, more uh, environmentally friendly decisions available to us in ways that we may, may not have had before. I know you're going to talk about in the next uh, period here some things around energy and the grid uh, and utilities and some of the things that are going to happen. But, you know, I would tell you that as disruptive as this environment seems as though it is, and I, and I think that it is, it is unsettling uh, that last 70 to 100 years that, that you and I were just talking about in really meaningful ways. And I think it has changed people. So for instance, your kids and my kids will never remember a time 
when certain things were done a certain way. They'll only know this period, but I think this period is actually tr uh, transitional, maybe not transformational, and maybe it's both, but in reality, I think it is just a, a, a beacon of things that are, that are to come. So Matthew, take a few minutes and uh, you're the futurist. Uh, tell, us what it, tell us what the world is gonna go to right now with this in mind. Yeah, so I think the iPhone revolution and data were the slingshot that really drove a lot of these changes. Yep. So think about what's going to be the slingshot that takes us into the future. What's going to change next? Speed. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. So I'll give you a couple. Of, I'll give you a number of examples. So if we think that we live in in, should we say, fast changing times today, but I said we've seen absolutely nothing yet now. Um, there's a whole bunch of different sort of proof points basically I can use for this, but let's just take the transportation industry. Um, simply because basically it's been stuck in the mud for about the past hundred years. So let's start accelerating that one out. Now, when you have a look at the use of artificial intelligence, for example, General Motors, basically as well as companies like Airbus are using creative machines to, in which are essentially artificial intelligence based creative machines that are able to design innovate and manufacture new products at extreme speed. So General Motors basically has been using creative machines to shave typically anywhere between half a ton to 50 kilos basically off of its, off of its uh, fleets uh, and off its vehicles to improve performance and efficiency. Um, we've had Airbus. Airbus is starting to use creative machines to help them design the new A330 Neo. Um, we have creative machines and artificial intelligences that are designing new solar panels and new solar materials basically which typically are going anywhere between about 20 to 48 percent energy efficient um in addition to that just another sort of proof point uh, can i pause you right there yeah. very quickly and just ask the the you know i, I was lucky enough to hear a, a, a speech at university of chicago a few years back where yeah. they thought we were on the tipping point on solar technology such that it wouldn't need subsidies anymore. The efficiency yeah. levels were about to get there. And you just mentioned some really interesting stats on that, which can be transformative in the way we both uh, generate electricity and consume it. Take a minute and talk about, about that. Yeah, sure. So, um, so when we have a look at solar, a typical solar panel basically that you might buy from Home Depot, Depot basically is going to be about 17% energy efficient. Um, the record-breaking silicon solar panels basically out of Japan are about 23% efficient. Um, record-breaking so record Perskovite-based solar panels can get up to about 32% efficiency. In the labs, we've also got bacterial-based solar panels, which can get up to about 50% energy efficient. We've got the US Department of Energy that has already built a concept solar panel that is 48% efficient. You can go and have a look at that one. Basically, that's up with ORNL and uh, Lawrence Livermore. Um, in addition to that, if you start using carbon nanotubes to capture the heat within a solar panel, you can get a solar panel that is 80% efficient. We've got these in the labs already. Then in addition to that, if you use something called black silicon, and again, we've already done this, and these are in the labs, but they come out of the labs, they get commercialized, mature, cost comes down and everything else. We've got a way to make solar panels 132% energy efficient. And if you're wondering how you actually have achieved that little miracle, for every single photon that hits a piece of black silicon, it kicks out two elect it kicks out 1.3 electrons. So, you know, when you have a look over in Dubai, they're building a six gigawatt solar farm, basically, and that's being ge that's generating electricity at about 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah, we are already starting to get to the point with solar where we can envisage a a point in time where the cost of generating electricity from solar-based sources is essentially zero. That's before we go to space-based solar, which NASA and the Chinese government, as well as European governments, are already starting to launch uh, space-based solar platforms, which beam solar, electric solar energy down to Earth. Um, and that's before we start talking about, you know, Bloomberg Neff recently put out a report saying that solar projects are now the lowest TCO of any type of electricity project. And solar itself is now the cheapest form of electricity in 58 countries. We don't need subsidies basically where solar is going, you know, and that's before we start talking about the rest of the renewable fleet. And from a solar perspective, we've now got 1 trillion watts installed, bearing in mind that the world is typically using and consuming about 6 trillion watts of, uh, of, uh, of, of energy capacity. So we've got a 
Yeah. And Matthew, on solar, well, what do you think? Said. And I want to go back to the Uber question here in just a minute, because I think there's some technology advances that are going to help support what the audience just said. But, yeah. but before we move off of solar, uh, what about storage capacity? Uh, yeah. Because it seems to always be the limiting factor on solar is what do you do? What do you do with the excess energy and how do you how do you store it? No, absolutely. So, I mean, if you have a look at a lot of the Texas blackouts, you know, there were quite a lot of articles, for example, on on sort of platforms and publications like Forbes saying, you know, when a solar panel gets covered in snow, it stops generating electricity. This is why basically you need fossil fuels basically to boost the grid. Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of different answers to that today, you know, not in the future, but today. So on the one hand, when you have a look at grid scale storage, the costs are coming down. We've got molten grid storage systems. We've got a whole variety of different things coming through. The cost of lithium iron um, grid scale storage systems is dropping. Uh, we can 3D print, for example, uh, lithium iron anodes, which means that those batteries have 400% more energy density than sort of traditional lithium iron batteries. Um, mm -hmm. But when we start having a look at solar itself, you know, so let's just sort of take that. Um, there's this great myth, basically, that solar panels do not work at night. Now, there's a particular technology called nanophotonic, uh, it's, it's a nanophotonic material. We actually have solar panels that work at night because if you can create a nanophotonic material, you can capture very, very low ambient light levels, even from lunar light. So we have solar panels that work at night. If you put a layer of graphene over a solar panel, you can capture energy or generate energy from rainwater. And as for Texas and snow, um, using the sort of same type of graphene approach, we've already got tech, we've already got solar panels that can generate electricity from snow while they're in snow. And then as for generating electricity in a cloudy day, we've got genetically engineered bacteria, which uh, aggregate sort of perscovite crystals to themselves. Uh, so we can generate electricity in cloudy days. Um, and as Elon Musk famously said when he came to the UK a couple of years ago, he said, you know, there is, there is more than enough sunlight hitting the earth, for example, in the rainy UK. Uh, and the evidence of that is because we've got green plants. It's just a case of trying to, it's just a case of trying to develop the technologies and particularly materials is the key with, um, with solar. Uh, and we're already there. You know, this is the stuff that's going to be coming through now and in the next 10 years. So, when you start having a look at the, the rise of new photovoltaic materials, you don't need grid scale storage because these things generate electricity day in, day out, at night, when it's cloudy, when it's snowing, when it's raining, ad infinitum. So this is fascinating. I want to, I'm going to ask you one more question about energy, and then I want to go back to transport with the Uber question. We're going to address the, the audience's answers there. Uh, you said 10 years. Where are we as it relates to energy sector and in particular the solar advances that you were just talking about and others in five, 10 and 15 years? Yeah. So uh, while we've got all these great technologies in the labs and starting to come out of the labs, you know, as I say, with the likes of, sort of Department of Energy and so on and so forth, you know, it's, these technologies have got to be uh, accessible, they've got to be affordable, they've got to be mature, they've got to be reliable, they've got to, you know, the regulators and the insurers basically have got to be able to approve them um, because you don't want your solar panels catching fire on your Walmart roof as sort of happened a little while ago. Um, so typically that process, even though we have these kind of ro rocket ship like technologies and sci-fi like technologies here now, it will generally take them about five years to get to the point where someone can start going out and saying, look what I just bought. Um, and at that mm. point, they'll be deceptive, so they'll be expensive, and then this, that cost starts coming down as we start scaling up manufacturing and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, so you think you think some of those technologies will start seeing uh, in consumers' hands and within the next five years and certainly within the 10? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a look, for example, at some of the genetically engineered bacteria-based uh, solar panels, um, they are dirt cheap to manufacture. You can manufacture them out of, out of China, basically for nothing, um, pretty much. And then when you also have a look at a lot of the oil companies, you know, I was speaking to a lot, number of oil companies over in California recently. Yeah, they're all starting to try to pivot to sort of move to, to things like graphene um, production and everything else. Um, a lot of these new, a lot of these technologies that are starting to emerge from the labs 
aren't actually that difficult to produce. You know, we've even got an artificial intelligence that is now working with, I say working with, working with one of the American universities to create a spray-on photovoltaic material. You know, bearing in mind that when you, when you have a look at the transportation sector, lithium ion batteries basically in a car, that's going to go away basically within about the next 10 to 15 years because you're going to have wirelessly charged cars, which reduce the amount of lithium ion batteries in these vehicles by about 80%. We've already got Lightyear One, we've got Hyundai, and we've got Toyota, who have already produced commercial, commercially available uh, solar-powered vehicles with unlimited range. You know, the costs always start here. The technology is generally hard to produce, but it always gets more ubiquitous. The cost performance improves over time. Um, but all of this is accelerating. So I was going to sort of mention earlier, you know, Toyota recently used, to put this speed idea into context, Toyota recently used an artificial intelligence to design an elect a new electric vehicle battery in 16 days and test it in 16 days. Normally, that process alone would take a vehicle manufacturer, by Toyota's own admission, two years. So we are ex all of these things that would normally have taken, say, 20 years to emerge from the labs, 10 years to emerge from the labs, they're starting to move out faster and faster particularly as a lot of the universities who are producing a lot of these innovations and these breakthroughs uh, figure out basically that, you know, how to handle and manage the IP, create startup incubators and ecosystems and everything else and actually commercialize this stuff. Well, I'll tell you, you and I will have to have another conversation about this in the future. I'm, I'm actually working with a good friend of mine who has a, an amazing opportunity in front of him. Uh, he wants to go all electric, uh, all electric trains, no catenary. Yeah, uh, which means a, a huge investment in battery technology, unless your spray on can work. Yeah. Um, but uh, but also thinking very critically about the cleanliness of creating those batteries, because we know that that sometimes uh, involves uh, some problematic things. I want to shift to to Uber because I, I do think that one of the things that may underscore the profitability of companies like Uber uh, is going to be the world of autonomy and uh, and how that goes. And and this is near and dear to my heart, having come out of, of USDOT. And uh, let me just put this on the, on the table, because when you address this, I want you to talk about the progression of, of, of technology yeah. and when it will be ready. And I want you to talk about the state of regulators. Yeah. Uh, I believe if you had walked through the halls of USDOT and asked everyone on the eve of Uber launching whether or not there was some failing in the market, some need that wasn't being met appropriately, I think universally the answer would have been no. Uh, we've got everything that we need. They didn't see the disruption or the consumer interest in the disruption coming. Had I think they had had more time, I think they would have regulated rideshare out of existence. I don't think it would be here. I think governments would have snuffed it out for a host of different reasons. Part of their success is the speed with which they, they stormed the market. Uh, and they, they satisfied this consumer need in such a way that, that the regulators couldn't, couldn't move against them. And so talk for a minute about the progression of technology on, on autonomy and also maybe the regulators' uh, position on it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll do regulators first. So um, when, you have a look at the, when you have a look at the rate of development of new technologies, I typically refer to them as being a rocket ship. Um, yeah, if you want me to show you any type of science fiction technology, whether it's holograms, whether it's streaming your brain to YouTube, whether it's tractor beams, just get in touch with me. I'll ping you the videos. You know, so we already have a lot of science fiction like technologies here, including robots that evolve themselves, self evolving artificial intelligences and everything else. You know, most people just don't see them, but that's kind of why I'm here. Um, so from a regulator's perspective, you know, you've got technology, which is this rocket ship. And I work with a lot of regulators and they always refer to themselves as, you know, we're not technologists. We are lawyers and policy wonks. Regulators traditionally have been the people who are on a bike with a puncture trying to catch up or trying to at least sort of keep up basically with a lot of these new technological developments. But on the one hand, you know, regulators are now trying to sort of get closer to startup communities to try to understand what startups and entrepreneurs are actually doing. They're developing new sandboxes, you know, whether you look at the FAA, the FDA, basically whether you look at the CAA in the UK, um, Ofcom, Ofgem, et cetera, et cetera. They're starting to figure basically that from a government perspective, every government basically wants to drive innovation because if you drive innovation, that's where you become the number one in a particular market. Uh, if you get to number one in a particular market, like the US is in the technology market, you, you, you 
your tax receipts increase hugely, your GDP increases, you know, your people are rich, fantastic. So regulators are kind of being pushed by central governments, especially to start trying to speed up and get to grips with all of these new disruptions and these new innovations, simply so governments can actually sort of reap the rewards of this stuff. Um, but when you have a look at some of the challenges in front of regulators, you know, take for example, a self-driving car. It's a neural network on wheels, where see, it's a black box. You know, if you go and ask it, why did it make that decision? Yeah, you know, it's even the experts who put these things together, basically find it very difficult to understand how these things are actually, um, making their decisions. And that's before we start talking about artificial intelligences like ones from Google and Microsoft and OpenAI and Baidu that are starting, and Facebook, that are already starting to self-evolve and self-design themselves. Um, now, from an autonomy perspective, you know, when we have a look at Uber, yeah, there's a, there's a, a huge runway here. So from Uber's perspective, uh, yeah, as Travis Kalanick said a little while ago, basically, you know, they want to get rid of the most expensive sort of asset, should we say, uh, that they have. That's the driver in the car. So you take the driver in the car, all of a sudden Uber's profits increase. Um, when we have a look at automation and the creation of autonomous companies as well, you can create, you can turn Uber basically into a pretty much fully autonomous company. They're called DAO, DAOs, Distributed Autonomous Organizations, and there are about 15 of them now, including a Wall Street fund and a fund based out of uh, Hong Kong. So when we have a look at automation and autonomy, as well as autonomous systems, um, we are now at what, Cat 3, Cat 4, basically on vehicles. We'll soon get mm -hmm. to Cat 5. Um, we've got, you know, the regulators talk about the safety of fully autonomous vehicles. We've got, photo we've got photonic cameras coming through that actually pick up individual photons of light, individual photons of light, not, you know, something that you sort of see on this camera, but little specks of light which enable them to see around corners and through walls. Um, mm. So when we start talking about you know, automation and the safety of all these different systems coming together, um, let alone the regulation of all of these different systems, it's a real bun fight. There's lots and lots going on. Um, and that's before we start pushing artificial intelligence to the edge, rolling out 5G, rolling out vehicle to X uh, sort of infrastructure technologies and so on and so forth. Um, it's, yeah, you know, and Uber, you know, this sort of stuff isn't lost on Uber. Uber know that if they can electrify their fleet and automate their fleet, then their profit margins go from this to this, which is why basically their, their, their VC backers are giving them billions, tens of billions of dollars still to scale and go big. Because when you take the person out of the car, when you start electrifying the fleet, all of a sudden your operating costs basically have now come down by about 40%. And that's extra money in your bank account. Absolutely. Well, it's going to be interesting. We, we spoke about this a lot in government. I mean, as you say, policy and regulators, uh, you know, the most common job in America is that of driver. Yeah. And uh, so we solve one problem, we, we create another. But uh, I don't think any uh, buggy whip manufacturers are, are, are hurting these days. They, uh, no. they found other things. You know, we've got just uh, about two and a half minutes left. Uh, I want to leave a little time for you, uh, Michael, to uh, I want you to talk about the importance of data in the future state. We talked about it in the, in the current state. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like for you to give us one or two really disruptive uh, kind of eye popping examples of things that we might uh, see that'll that'll change things. And especially with an idea of who our audience is. Uh, these are P3 enthusiasts. They're believers. They think about the, the marriage between the private and, and government sectors. Uh, to drive what is traditionally public infrastructure solutions for to the, to the citizens. Yeah. But before we do that, I'm just going to tell people if, if there are any questions uh, that, that want to be asked, I'll try to ask one or two of them just before we get through there. There'll be quick pop questions. But Michael, uh, data and then and then two really eye popping predictions for me. Yeah. Uh, so from a data perspective, there's also kind of this fallacy basically that you know, in the future we need more and more data so that we can train artificial intelligences to be better. Um, but increasingly, when you start having a look at things like zero-shot learning, artificial intelligences, basically again from companies like Baidu, Google, OpenAI, DeepMind basically with MuZero, basically which is now being used by the American government to do some rather random things. Um, data, in increasingly, while we will have access to huge volumes of data from more sources, when you know I follow sensor technologies, for example, among the other 450 exponential technologies that I track, yeah, just when you start having a look at 
the development of sensors. You know, the, we've already got quantum sensors coming through, which are 100 million times more sensitive than today's best sensor technologies, hyperspectral sensors, we've got ultrasonic sensors, I mean, you name it. Uh, all these different sensors can be used to detect different information. That information can, can be combined in different ways. It can be then combined with sensor fusion at the edge of the network, based on where the decision is made at the edge of the network, rather than having to go back to the big hyperscale you know, cloud data center. Um, so even when we start having a look at the role of big data, we're going to have more data. But then from an artificial intelligence perspective, AIs are already starting to teach themselves in new ways, learn new things, and to quote kind of Google DeepMind, because they are learning new things in new ways, they're actually making their own new knowledge. So they're seeing things and seeing patterns that we humans simply don't see because their learning is fundamentally different to ours. And then in terms of sort of, you know, predictions, uh, when you have a look at uh, the acceleration of technologies, technologies are very, very good at decentralizing and democratizing access to everything. Um, just using this webcam that you guys are all sort of watching us through now, I could give you a full health check. I could check your mental health and your physical health just with an artificial intelligence shoved on my uh, sorry, shoved on my desktop. So everything, whether it's transportation, whether it's healthcare, can all be decentralized and democratized in new ways. When we think about transportation systems, for example, you know, why are we thinking multimodal? Why aren't we thinking unimodal, where you get into that Uber cab basically outside your office? And it takes you onto a Hyperloop train. That Hyperloop takes you to the next city. You use that same pod to get off, and it takes you home. Think unimodal. You know, think think unimodal, not multimodal. Um, but then, from a from a, 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 a sort of an energy perspective, a infrastructure perspective, a health perspective, an education perspective, um, a transportation perspective, pr public private partnerships basically have got to work. And increasingly, they're going to be more vital, not le not le not less vital uh, moving as we move into the future, particularly when we start having a look at how governments are now starting to circle around the concept of public wealth and how they can actually start using all of these different assets that they have today to help them generate income and tax dollars basically tomorrow so that that can fund tomorrow's infrastructure purchases. Uh, so lots going on. I know we're out of time. Um, but uh, yeah, those, those are sort of my two cents. Matthew, that's fantastic. And I want to thank you for that. The next time we'll take this conversation, we're actually going to, I want to talk about the emergence of those technologies, the deployment of those technologies mm -hmm. in first world economies versus emerging economies yeah. and kind of the, the, the way that that may shake out across the, the globe. Yeah. I think that'd be a fascinating next chapter to this discussion. But Listen, this has been a real joy. I want to, again, thank the organizers for the opportunity to sit down with you. I want to thank you for making time. Uh, this has been enlightening to me and, and, and just a, a real privilege. And uh, I hope everybody's having a great day here with, uh, uh, with all of the speakers and the panels. Uh, what, a, what great content. And we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jim. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.